Hello, this is Robert Rickover at Body Learning, and today my guest is Joanne Widner, an Alexander Technique teacher who lives near Richmond, Virginia. Before she became an Alexander teacher, she spent many years in healthcare as a registered nurse and exercise psychologist. She physiologist. Wor- physiologist, sorry. <laughs> she works with, that's a good point, yeah. She works with a diverse group of students, and she's especially interested in how the Alexander Technique can help people who live with chronic illness and pain. She works a lot with horseback riders, and she also uh, is interested in exploring the connections between the Alexander Technique and Tai Chi. Uh, Today, we're going to talk, our topic is, is the Alexander Technique really good for everything? And what does that mean in terms of our uh, credibility to a certain extent? Uh, Joanne, welcome to the show. Thank you, Robert. It's good to be here. It's good to talk to you. Um, could, could you begin by j- giving our listeners a very short description or definition of the Alexander Technique? Sure. The um, Alexander Technique is a mind-body technique. It involves both our thinking and our physical being. It's a set of skills for quieting our nervous system and reducing excess muscle tension. And then once we have done this, we've got a great more latitude about how we respond, whether that's going to be moving into physical activity or whether it's going to be responding to a question or answering an email. Mm -hmm. And because it works on both the mind and body level, then it helps us with a wide variety of activities. Mm -hmm. And the question that, that you raise that we're going to talk about, is the Alexander Technique really good for everything, I think emerged from your experience uh, when when you were teaching nursing students right. uh, on the question of how do you uh, evaluate claims for various uh, methods and uh, of kind of a fundamental um, well, maybe you should describe that, but the fundamental idea that if some if a, if something claims to help a lot of things, then maybe you should be suspicious of it. Right, right. Um, in nursing school, uh, there's a tremendous focus on critical thinking, mm-hmm. and uh, with good reason. And uh, one of the things that we would uh, do a little unit on was how do you evaluate a health claim on, a, on the web. Mm-hmm. And um, there are several questions uh, to answer when you open up a website and, and see, ah, you know, this does this and this and this. And um, so one of the first questions uh, that we teach our students to ask is, um, is this a credible site? And what kind of claims is it making? And if it's making some large claims or broad claims, this can fix this, this can fix that, it can help with this, then little red flags should go up because mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, usually things are, are a little bit more narrow in what they can help. And if you get a wide variety of claims, then that may not be true. There may be some truth stretching mm-hmm. happening. And in fact, uh, it's it's got a name. It is called the snake oil ploy. Yeah. Oh, right. And, and for listeners who are not from the U.S., uh, the concept of snake oil salesmen is a, a common trope in in the U.S. People who would travel around selling remedies that would take care of everything, right. or all sorts of things. Yeah. Right. And they usually involved a little alcohol. Yeah, they very frequently <laughs> involved alcohol. Yeah. So, of course, uh, when we're talking about the Alexander Technique, there are um, claims of a sort that the technique can help with a wide variety of things, right? That's right. And um, how do how do we reconcile that um, what you just said with, with the fact that the technique does seem to help 
a, a lot of things. And I, I, when you brought that up to me, I thought I, I had to do a lot of thinking about that. And I guess one of the things I would I would say in response to that question is that we are not actually claiming to cure things. I, I think even the most I don't I I don't really think any Alexander teachers are claiming to cure anything these days. I I certainly hope not. Um but we do uh suggest that the technique could help with a lot of things. Yes, that's that's true. And I and I think you're correct. Most teachers are pretty guarded when a student will come to them and say, "Can you cure my back pain?" Um I don't think too many teachers would say, oh, yes, definitely. I think they would say, we may be able to help you. Let's try some sessions and and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, we can legitimately say it has helped a lot of people with back pain, to take that example. mm -hmm. We can even point to a large-scale study that took place in the UK um, that supports that view to a certain extent. Um, but as but we are generally pretty careful about not saying that we cure things. We teach, Alexander teachers are are pretty careful in saying that 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 they are teachers, not therapists. Right. And that we don't we don't cure. We don't diagnose. We certainly don't go around diagnosing diseases, and we don't claim to to cure them and it occurred to me that that in a way it it's a, a difference between the the western medical model and things that don't necessarily fit into that and i think the alexander technique doesn't fit well into the classic medical model of things uh, so that I mean that's one difference that it, it, when when you're when you were teaching nursing students to evaluate websites, um, it would often be for remedies for specific things, a pill to do this, or maybe a device that would take care of this problem, that sort of thing. Uh, health claims. Health claims. Yeah. Basically, you know. Um... Uh, this this device will cure your back pain that you, right. you strap on. Um, this uh, herb will make you feel like you're 21 again. Right. Uh, th- these right. kinds of claims. And often covering a wide variety. It, it would they would take care of a lot of things sometimes according right. to the claims. Yeah. Right. And I so I think there's a little difference in that we're not. What we're saying, I think, I hopefully we're articulating it well, is that we help people improve the way they uh, basically organize themselves for movement and posture and things like that. And that in itself can have all sorts of ramifications. It can affect our breathing, can affect the way we move, can affect whether we're likely to get back pain or neck pain, that kind of thing. But I don't think that most teachers. I, I think the, I think the general theme would be teachers would say, well, the technique can help with a lot of things, and it may not. You may go into it. You may start taking lessons because of back issues, but you might discover that there are other things that are, in a way, being addressed with your lessons that don't seem to have much connection with your back pain. You think that's a fair statement? I think that's true, you know, and I I think the reason the Alexander Technique can help with so many different things is because it's addressing the function of of the one common denominator, and that is the person themselves. Yes. And how well they are functioning physically, and also how well they're using their brain which is, uh, you know, a wonderful tool for right. navigating our way through this world. And if we can put mind and body together and use them uh, in a skillful way, um, then that's going to help a lot of things. Mm-hmm. And there are a bunch of um, of things. I just 
created a quick little list, and I'm sure there are many others. I, 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 I wrote out exercise, Tai Chi, meditation, yoga, dieting, acupuncture. These are all things that are sort of seen by many people in the medical profession as being useful from, you know, that they've had, an, doctors have had enough uh, clients, patients who have used them and benefited that they're accepted as maybe have, being useful for a bunch of things. And I think in a funny way, the Alexander Technique fits into that group a bit, um, n- non-medical things that can help you do, a, help you improve in a variety of ways. Right, and I, I think physicians are in a difficult situation mm-hmm. when a patient comes to them and, and says, should I you know, do yoga or should I take Alexander Technique? Um, if it's something they've never heard of, then there's no way they can say yes or no. Mm-hmm. They've got to be familiar with something. And, um, and I think it is... Um, partly, you know, how popular is something. If they're getting a lot of questions about something, uh, they're probably going to do a little research and and find out about it. And also, as things become more popular, I think um, people who are the professionals who are are teaching uh, Mm -hmm. or performing the service, they're very interested in getting, in enhancing their credibility. Mm -hmm. Um, because that is what physicians look for, and that's what they feel comfortable with. Right, right. And Alexander Technique definitely fits that uh, mold because we've been around for a long time, over 100 years. Right. And we have a lot of anecdotal evidence. We have a lot of people who are pretty prominent saying, yes, Alexander Technique is very helpful, among mm-hmm. them a, a noble prize winner. Two, two Nobel Two Nobel Prize, prize winners. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's, uh, as far as levels of scientific evidence, that's kind of the lowest level. Right. Our anecdotal right. findings and right. recommendations. Right. Um, what they really place stock in are um, clinical trials. Mm-hmm. And so, even though Alexander teachers are, you know, they've worked with it enough to be pretty convinced of Alexander Technique's effectiveness, mm-hmm. Um, what the what the physicians are going to pay attention to is what do they find in their latest journal, you know, and if they find a study, then that that really enhances credibility. And mm-hmm. so, I'm so pleased whenever we see the results of a Alexander Technique uh, clinical trial reported in a journal such as the medical, uh, the British Medical Journal, mm-hmm. um, because that that really enhances our credibility. Mm-hmm. And, of course, a lot of these other things, just in that short list I came up with, are a lot better known to the general public than the Alexander Technique is. I mean, everyone's doing yoga these days, right. it seems. And, right. And, um, and we're starting to see some injuries from it, too. Well, of course, yeah. That's, yeah. When, uh, when it's um, not done. But correctly. it's interesting even how something gets into the popular imagination. I mean, acu- acupuncture, which actually is a medical process or part of traditional Chinese medicine, um, I don't think very many people in the West knew much about it at all until um, Nixon and, and Kissinger and all went to China and someone got sick and went to the hospital and acupuncture was used to alleviate pain. Mm-hmm. I, it might have been Kissinger. I don't know. It was some, someone in the delegation maybe. And suddenly everyone in America was talking about acupuncture. Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly before that, I think it was pretty pretty not well known. But, but what I want to get to also is things say things like exercise and dieting, which aren't really procedure, aren't, specific procedures i think most doctors would would accept the fact that exercise and and diet if if undertaken well will have all sorts of beneficial effects blood pressure um cholesterol stuff like that right 
<laughs> so yeah, that's, it's, it's that's not true. hard for uh, them to, to it, that that makes perfect sense, I think, to a lot of physicians. But I think well, the, it, pro- yeah. it makes sense, and yet uh, it's also been an area of study. I mean, my master's is in exercise physiology, right. and there is a big um, bulk of evidence um, about you know what type of exercise is effective, and uh, what is the least le- likely to injure someone, mm-hmm. what's appropriate for someone with a history of cardiac problems, that sort of thing. So, right, right. Um, you know, there is research supporting it. And, and like I say, that's that's really what will get a physician's buy-in, either that or if they or someone in their family has a really good personal experience, then you will get buy-in as well. Right, right. But it, so it is possible, I think, for the medical profession to accept that that some non-medical interventions, as it were, can have a, a wide range of effects and perhaps a bit unpredictable. I don't think, for example, I know that uh, doctors will often recommend their patients lose weight to help with um, cholesterol. Uh-huh. for example. But that doesn't mean that someone's going to lose 10 pounds and their cholesterol is going to go down uh, an X number of points. It, it's just very likely that there will be some effect, but it's not a one-to-one relationship. Right, because you've got a lot of factors at play. And that, and I think that, the analogy between that and the Alexander technique in terms of a process that can have a lot of effects, but they can't be spelled out specifically is a pretty good analogy you know we, you don't know you take alexander lessons you you your back pain might go away but you might also find something else happens that's even more interesting you know mm-hmm. that that kind of thing so mm-hmm. to me maybe one of the big issues is just getting the technique better known in the medical profession for what it is and what it isn't you yeah I, th- I think that's always worth putting effort and energy into yeah so is there anything else you want to add add to this uh, that i haven't touched on this whole question um, well we focused uh quite a bit about um you know proving our worth to physicians uh, mm-hmm. by meeting the criteria that they they prize mm-hmm. um not everyone comes from a, a medical background like i do or a healthcare background um mm-hmm. they're other people who um, they may not require that level of proof mm-hmm. per se mm-hmm. uh, they're going to put stock in someone's recommendation or uh, they're going to look and see well how much training mm-hmm. um, does an Alexander teacher right. need to have do they have a professional organization which we do yes that's um, true. so I think those kinds of things really help boost our credibility. Right. And I I think we're going to have a second conversation um, more directed at Alexander teachers about maybe some suggestions of how to how to deal with claims of of the techniques effectiveness but just in general it would seem like you'd want we'd want to be very careful uh, as I think we generally have been, to stay away from ideas of cure and uh, very, very specific claims about what the work can do. Because, uh, as you said, we're, we're dealing with human beings changing the way they're thinking, changing the way they're moving. And it's it's not really possible to specify in advance what's going to happen when someone goes for Alexander lessons, right? That, I mean, just, that's right. That's and, not, right. and not just, even not just Alexander lessons, but the fact that how, there really isn't a standardized Alexander lesson. I mean, teachers, there are a number of teaching traditions where what goes on in a lesson can differ quite a bit from one tradition to another or even from one teacher to another. So, and of course, that would be true of Tai Chi and meditation and yoga, and certainly diet. I mean, diets have been there, there's gone a whole range everywhere. Of out and there. <laughs> what was what was good last year is terrible this year. You know, um, 
what are what are healthy foods to eat at least in America, all the unhealthy ones, the standard unhealthy ones have suddenly become healthy. Uh, chocolate, coffee, um, I can't think of all of them right now, but eggs. <laughs> used to be you weren't supposed to have eggs if you were worried about yeah. cholesterol. You know, so there, there, there's, there's, there have been changes in all of those, but I think, I think what, what, what these all have in common, including the Alexander Technique, is you bring about a general improvement, but to say exactly what that's going to be, we have to be a little, a little bit cautious. Yeah, I, I think so. But I think we can say some things with a, a fair degree of confidence, mm-hmm. you know, that, that we can improve physical functioning. Absolutely that, uh, yeah. That we can help people reduce their stress by mm-hmm. working with their thinking and their mm-hmm. level of physical tension. Mm-hmm. Um, and that we can help people improve their performance. Yeah. We've got just a lot of evidence. A lot and, of evidence uh, on that. A lot of just good common sense. <laughs> beyond right. yeah. specific evidence um, that shows that we can do that. So, right. yeah. Right. Well, you know, I think, um, I, I don't know that I've ever really heard a discussion of the, of the kind we're having before. So I'd like to put it out there. If anyone listening to this would like to add some thoughts, um, let me know or let Joanne, no, and we could do uh, another podcast if 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 there's if there's some other insights that we've missed. But <clears throat> I think the big thing is I think for right now just to to put it out there. Yeah, the Alexander technique is a pretty powerful method, but we can't promise specifics. Maybe that's a good way to put it. What do you think? Yeah, I, I don't think we can. Um you know, give a, a quantifiable type thing, which is what I think a lot of times science wants. Yeah. You know, they want to be able to say X equals, you know, Y plus two or whatever. Or you take this number of <laughs> pills, like, you know, say something like antibiotic, uh, you know, you take this number, this sequence of antibiotics and there's a good chance that At the, uh, right. yeah, things are going to get better. We don't really have quite that. We don't have quite that sort of a system that we can talk about it that way. Right, and yeah. and I and I think that's, you know, because you're you're dealing with a human being, and we're so complex. Right. I mean, if and, all you're doing is wanting to kill some some uh, bacteria or whatever, we, we can be pretty specific about ways to do it. But if you want to change the way you function on a physical level, then the details emerge over time and neither the teacher or the student can say with any precision exactly what's going to happen. Right. Yeah. But usually it's something good. It's pretty much always something good, I would yeah. say from experience, but um yeah. Well, maybe this would be a good place to to end our conversation. Okay. Um my uh my guest today has been uh Joanne Widner, an Alexander Technique teacher who lives near Richmond, Virginia. If uh if anything that we've talked about interests you, um we'll, I'll put a link to her site by the interview. You can if you live in the Richmond, Virginia area, give her a, a call. I'll also put a um link to a website that'll enable you to learn more about the Alexander Technique and find a teacher in your area and has a a whole page devoted to medical and scientific research and endorsements. So that might be of interest to you to take a look at. Um, Joanne, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, you're welcome, Robert. Good to talk with you again.